When you think of animals, what do you think of? The big charismatic animals of the African savannas? The cute red pandas at the zoo? The animals you may see on a farm? These are the animals that most people think of. The vertebrates. But the truth of the matter is, over 95% of all animal species are invertebrates, and most of those belong to only 8 phyla. There are 34 phyla of invertebrates, some only containing a single species, while another phylum contains nearly 85% of all animal species in the world. Today, we are going to concentrate on the major characteristics that makes an invertebrate an invertebrate. And we'll be looking at those eight most common and recognizable phyla of invertebrates. First, what exactly is an invertebrate? Well, invertebrates are animals in the kingdom Animalia that lack a vertebral column or backbone. Some of the characteristics that help us put invertebrates into categories called a phylum are the animal's body plan or symmetry, if the animal has a head or not, and the way it digests its food. Invertebrates have three basic body plans called symmetry. If it has two similar halves like we do, then it has bilateral symmetry. If its body parts are arranged in a circle around a central point, it has radial symmetry. Then if it seems like there is no symmetry at all, this is called asymmetrical symmetry. The simplest of all animals have asymmetrical symmetry. The sponges. Many people just don't realize that sponges are in fact animals. Sponges are in the phylum periphera, and in fact are sessile or immobile animals that lack nerves. In fact, they don't have any organs or organ systems at all. Rather, they are made up of a grouping of cells that work together to meet the survival needs of the sponge. These cells are supported by a skeleton of spicules, which are slivers of carbon carbonate or silica. Just like us, sponges have epithelial cells. In their case, these cells are called porocytes. These cells connect the outside of the sponge to the inside cavity. The water flowing through these cells transport plankton through them, and this is what the sponge eats, not Krabby Patties. As animals become more complex, we start to use the other characteristics mentioned before. Let's take a look at a phylum called Cnidaria. The jellyfish, corals, and the sea anemones. All cnidarians exhibit radial symmetry and have tentacles around their mouth and stinging cells. In fact, cnidaria comes from the Greek word of nidos, which means stinging nettle. These cells are called nematocytes, which give the phylum its name. These cells inject venom into their prey or a potential predator. These animals can reproduce either asexually or sexually and can be free-swimming medusa forms or sessile polyps. Some species exist as both forms at some point in their lives. Coral is a very unique cnidarian. These animals form massive colonies called reefs, the largest being the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia. This colony of invertebrates stretches over 1,400 miles over an area that covers 133 square miles. These corals provide habitat and nesting grounds for over a million marine species, making coral a keystone species for our oceans. Without them, our oceans would not be what they are today. The first time we see bilateral symmetry is within the phylum Platyhelminthes, or simply put, the flatworms. These unsegmented worms lack a body cavity other than the mouth and anus. They also lack a respiratory and circulatory system. So, how do these organisms get the essential oxygen they need if they don't breathe in, like us? Well, it's a process called diffusion, 
and oxygen molecules can diffuse through their skin. This is also the first time in the animal kingdom we start to see a head, sometimes with distinct eye spots. Most flatworms are parasitic. Think about the parasitic tapeworm. That's a flatworm. And that's why you should probably put your pets on a regular dewormer. But other flatworms are free living, which feed on bacteria, smaller worms, and even dead organic matter. Another phylum that exhibits bilateral symmetry, but has more of a cylindrical shape, is the phylum Nematoda, the roundworms. These parasitic worms are some of the most abundant animals in the world, having over 28,000 different species, with around 16,000 being parasitic. Nematodes also lack a respiratory and circulatory system, but are more complex than the flatworms in that they show tissue level organization. They are sexually dimorphic, meaning that there is a difference between the male and the female, and can reproduce either sexually or asexually. These worms can live in aquatic environments, in our soils, and even inside other organisms. The species that aren't parasitic can feed on fungi, bacteria, other roundworms, and even some of our insect pests in our garden. They play a very important role in nutrient cycling of our ecosystems, but can also feed on plant roots inhibiting growth. What about worms that have bilateral symmetry, have organ system organization, have a well-developed circulatory and digestive system, and have segmented bodies? Well, they have their own phylum, Phylum Annelida. These 17,000 species of worms can live in marine, freshwater, and terrestrial ecosystems. Most annelid worms are hermaphroditic, meaning that they have both male and female reproductive organs. They also can reproduce sexually or asexually. If you have ever been fishing, you know that some of these segmented worms make for great bait, like earthworms and leeches. 23% of all marine organisms belong to a single phylum, the second largest phylum of all animals, the mollusk, or phylum mollusca. This phylum consists of some of the widest range of body forms of all invertebrates. Most have a head, a soft body mass, and a muscular foot. All mollusks have one or all of the following characteristics, a radula, a calcium carbonate shell, and a mantle. The cephalopods are the most advanced mollusks in that their heads are very well developed and have sophisticated sense organs and their foot is modified into prey capturing arms. Other mollusks include snails, slugs, squid, mussels, and clams. A very recognizable phylum of invertebrates simply by their shapes and skin are the echinoderms, phylum echinodermata, a phylum that is exclusively in marine environments. This phylum includes all the starfish, sea urchins, sand dollars, and sea cucumbers. And the word echinoderm translates to spiny skin. Echinoderms have a structure called an endoskeleton made up of calcium carbonate. These species date back clear to the Cambrian period 500 million years ago. Their diets can range from herbivores like sea urchins, filter feeders like sand dollars, and even predators like starfish. These predators will prey on mussels, coral, clams, and even other echinoderms. Now to talk about the phylum of invertebrates that is most recognizable to most people. Phylum Arthropoda, which translates to jointed foot. This massive phylum consists of nearly 85% of all animal species in the world, and all of them have an exoskeleton, which is a protective outer layer made of chitin, the same protein that makes the cell wall of fungi. 
They all have segmented bodies, jointed appendages, bilateral symmetry, a dorsal blood vessel, and a ventral nerve cord. Arthropods can be divided into four major groups. The myriapods, which is a group that has one pair of antenna and a multi-segmented trunk with multiple pairs of legs. The most recognizable being the millipedes and the centipedes. Then there's the tastiest of all invertebrates. Well, maybe that's just my opinion, but let's talk about the crustaceans. A group with two pair of antenna, more than five pairs of limbs, and have gills. Most crustaceans live either in marine or freshwater ecosystems, but some live in terrestrial environments. This group includes crabs, lobsters, shrimp, crayfish, sand fleas, barnacles, and pill bugs, or simply roly polies. Most people's least favorite group, of course, are the arachnids. This group consists of the scorpions, pseudoscorpions, mites, ticks, daddy longlegs or harvestmen, and of course, the spiders. Arachnids do not have antenna, wings, or claws. It'd be kind of terrifying if they did. Instead, they have eight limbs, an fused head and thorax called a cephalothorax. And finally, the largest group of arthropods, class Insecta. These arthropods all have six legs, compound eyes, and a pair of antenna. This is by far the most familiar group of arthropods. These animals live everywhere except the oceans. There's even a species that lives in Antarctica. If you recall from the Domains and Kingdoms video, if you don't, then you should probably go back and check that one out. Classifying animals goes Domain, Kingdom, Phylum, Class, Order, Family, Genus, Species. Right now, we are in the Phylum, Arthropoda, and Class, Insecta. But there are over 30 orders, including the orders of flies, bees, wasps, and ants, beetles, moths and butterflies, grasshoppers, true bugs, and many more, each serving important ecological functions we wouldn't be able to function as a society without. In fact, all of the invertebrates that we talked about today serve these functions. Functions like pollination, decomposition, being both predator, keeping the ecological balance, and prey, supporting other species. They clean our waters. They're important at recycling nutrients in our ecosystems. They build our precious coral reefs. You can easily see just how important invertebrates are to us and our natural world. I hope this video has helped learning about invertebrates and you have a better understanding as why you should think about invertebrates more instead of just the big charismatic animals. Be sure to subscribe to learn more about our natural world and all other sciences.